looks like we have no input. Unfortunately, I just turned this on. Let's see if I can get it. This will probably do it. I'm glad. I hope, I hope you're glad. <laughs> you do have a quiz due by midnight tonight. So if you haven't started on it, make sure you get going. I, I think it's probably not going to take you as long as the last quiz is, but it might be long. Make sure you get that done. And again, we have exam three in one week. Exam three will cover what? Uh, let's see, so the last exam. The last exam we ended with essentially the Cauchy, Cauchy's theorem, cauchy cortot theorem. Um, that could certainly come up again on exam three, as, as it's on the quiz. Cauchy integral formula, uh, you know, the maximum principle, Liouville's theorem. And then to chapter five, sequences series, Taylor series, power series. And what we're going to start on Friday, which is called Laurent series, is something new. We're, I might mention a few things in section 5.4. It's called the mathematical theory of convergence, but I'm not going to assign any problems from it. And you're not going to need to know most of it. Maybe I'll mention a thing or two that you should know from it. So I think 5.5, like I said, 5.5 we'll get to on Friday. I think a little bit of 5.6 next Monday before the test. And then I'll review for the test next Monday and you've got the test Wednesday next week. Okay. So again, quiz five due by midnight tonight. I think this is gonna be the last quiz. After the exam next week, there's gonna be no more quizzes and no more exams till the final one, so you'll have time work on the project a little bit more, and I think I'll probably reduce the, the uh, workload for the journal. There probably will st it's still be some things to do from it. And you should still study my keys, you know, prep for the final exam, but probably there'll be less work to do in the journal. Today we're going to focus on the theory of sequences series, Taylor series, and power series. And I think worth, it's worthwhile talking a little bit about what's called uniform convergence versus what you might call plain, quote unquote, pointwise convergence of a sequence. First of all, of real functions. Well, okay, let, let me state the definition with complex functions, but we're going to visualize it, at least initially, with real functions. All right, so we're given a sequence. There's my notation for sequences. This makes you think a sequence is a set. It's not really a set. So this, this is a bit misleading, but it's what I'm, most, what I'm most used to. It's not really a set. It is a, it's an ordered list. You know, sets don't have to have an order to them. The, th the, el the order that you list elements in a set is irrelevant. But with sequences, you've got an F1, then an F2, then an F3, then an F4. There's an ordering to them. So even though it makes it look like it's a set, it's not really. These are going to be complex valued functions of a complex variable. Maybe I should put this in parentheses. That's, the, that's going to be a, the going assumption. Though again, we'll visualize it initially, at least in terms of real functions. Uh, converges pointwise to some function f on some subset of the complex plane if the corresponding sequence of real of complex numbers that's better darker here the corresponding sequence of complex numbers that we can form 
by plugging those complex numbers into these functions, converges to f of z, and this will happen for all z in, in the set t. Okay? This is what you might call plane or pointwise convergence. For each point, z and t, this sequence of numbers converges to that number. Think of z as fixed here. For each fixed z and t, this sequence of numbers converges to that number. You can write this in terms of epsilons, i.e., uh, for all z and t, and for all epsilon greater than zero, let me, just, let me say given z and t instead of for all. Given z and t, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a natural number, capital N, so that the distance between Fn of z and f of z can be made less than epsilon for all little n greater than the capital n. This is the kind of definition you get all the time in the real analysis. Given an arbitrary z and t, and given an arbitrary epsilon, it's going to be a measure of how close I want the values to be to f of z. I can find a sufficiently large number, capital N call it, so that this distance between these values, these complex numbers, think of these as fixed complex numbers, can be made less than that by epsilon. If f of z is right here, you think of epsilon as the radius of disk, the sequence of points, fn of z, has eventually got to get in that disk and stay in that disk, no matter how small epsilon is. But the smaller epsilon is, the bigger n will need to be, typically. Pointwise convergence is a phenomenon that's not quite good enough to prove much. You can have limits of pointwise converging functions be, that are continuous be discontinuous. We actually already saw this. Think about xn, x to the n over the interval from negative 1 to 1. This sequence of functions actually, if you include negative 1 in the domain here, is not converging to a function because at negative 1, the outputs bounce back and forth between negative 1 and, 1 and positive 1. Over the interval from negative 1 to 1, not including negative 1, but including 1, it is converging pointwise to a function. That function is the zero function when x is bigger than negative 1, but less than positive 1, and equals 1 when x is 1, because this point never moves. So it's converging pointwise to a discontinuous function, even though each individual function in the sequence is continuous. That's sort of like, well, that's not very good, you might say. What's a stronger form of convergence that allows us to say that if a sequence of functions converges this way, and the sequence consists of continuous functions, that the limit function is continuous? It's called uniform convergence. This is not converging uniformly. Um, even on the open interval from negative 1 to 1, it's not converging uniformly to the zero function because what I have here is I have an epsilon tube, it's called. The value of epsilon is 0.1. I've got this tube around the x-axis centered at y equals zero of height or well, vertical radius, you might call it, 0.1. Epsilon is 0.1. Epsilon is this vertical height right here and right here. And the sequence of functions is confer converging pointwise on this interval to the zero function, but it's not converging uniformly. And basically, the idea, the intuitive idea, is that 
even no matter what epsilon is, even for really large values of, of n, there are going to be points on this graph that are not inside this tube. If they were inside the tube, it would be called a uniform convergence. And here's an official definition of uniform convergence. Right now. We say the sequence of functions, same sequence as before, say, define and accept t in the complex plane, converges uniformly to f on this given set t in the complex plane. If for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N, a sufficiently large positive integer such that the distance between fn of z and f of z is less than epsilon, here's the key, for all z in t. Now you might look at this definition and compare it with this one and say, well, what's the difference? The difference is, where is the z in t? Back here, I was saying, give me some fixed z in t and give me some epsilon. And I can find a sufficiently large capital N so that if little n is greater than or equal to capital N, the distance between fn and z and fn of z and f of z is less than epsilon. Over there, I put the for all epsilon, for all z and t at the end. What I'm saying is give me an arbitrary epsilon, the neighborhood of f of z zero, say. Well, okay. Give me an arbitrary epsilon. I can find sufficiently large n so that this is true. I forgot to say something. When little n is greater than or equal to capital N, for all z and t, I'm saying this inequality is true. Here I was thinking of z as fixed. And I got that. In terms of a real function, Say you have an arbitrary real function, call it f of x. And you got an arbitrary given epsilon. Draw a tube, analogous to that tube, of radius, so to speak, vertical radius epsilon, meaning give me any point here on this black graph the vertical distance between the black graph and either red graph is epsilon. And it happens no matter where you are. I'm saying no matter what epsilon is, I can go out sufficiently far, I can find a sufficiently large capital N, so that if little n is bigger than equal to that capital N, the distance between these things is less than epsilon for all z and t, in this case for all x in the interval here. So my initial um, functions in the sequence, f1 of x, f2 of x, f3 of x, don't necessarily have to be inside this tube. They could be doing something like this. That could be f1, this could be f2. But eventually, no matter how small epsilon is, since this inequality has got to be true for all x here, that would mean my graphs have to get inside the tube and stay in the side of the tube, no matter how small epsilon is. Though again, the epsilon, as epsilon gets smaller, the capital N typically needs to be bigger. You typically need to go up further in the sequence to make sure your functions Fn are, have the graphs that are inside the tube. It's easier to visualize with real functions. Let's do another example here. It's the same function, but now the interval is from negative 0.95 to positive 0.95 instead of negative 1 to 1. The convergence is uniform on that interval to the zero function. The graphs eventually get inside this tube and stay inside the tube so for sufficiently large n. You can see just barely once n gets to 40 here, but at this point just barely gets inside the tube at the end. At least real close. I can make n go larger here to make sure of it. Instead of 40, why don't I pick 100?
Now all those black crafts are definitely inside the tube once the end gets large enough. But what if I make the tube small? What if I make epsilon smaller? Watch the tube here, it gets smaller. Can I still get inside that tube and stay inside the tube? The answer is yes, because the convergence is uniform. Whereas again, in this example up here, the convergence was not uniform. I cannot get inside the tube and stay inside the tube for sufficient, sufficiently large end. There's always going to be a piece of graph over here and over here or down here that's outside the tube. So that's not uniform convergence. Can this be visualized with complex functions? Well, I tried a little bit the other day. On my own. I was thinking of, well, why not do the exact same example? except think of the input as z instead of x. Maybe I can focus on just the real part so I can actually graph it. Would we see a similar kind of phenomenon with the real part? Oops. For this first one, I'm graphing it on the square where x goes from negative 1 to 1 and y goes from negative 1 to 1. What happens to these graphs is the real part of, that, of z to the n as n increases. That's what the graphs look like. Why is the stuff working here? Great. Did that happen once earlier in the semester? Remember? I thought that happened once earlier in the semester. <coughs> Hopefully, it will not do it again. Warm it up. Is this annoying thing? The manipulates don't work right away. Never happened before mathematical camp. This kind of bug happened, but manipulates don't work right away. Try to imagine what this is converging to. Well, when you're close to the origin, it seems like maybe it's converging to the zero function. And it is actually at a sufficiently small neighborhood of zero. It is converging to the zero function. But as you approach the boundary of the square, it doesn't seem to be settling down toward the zero function or any function for that matter. Maybe the problem is the domain. Yeah, this is not uniform convergence. You might wonder, well, could I restrict the domain by adding in a region function to restrict the domain to being just the disk? But you could try that. Let's see, okay, we're getting already. So now we're just scrapping it above the unit disk, including the boundary. And yeah, it seems like it's not converging to anything on the boundary. But what if we zoomed in closer to the origin? It looks like close to the origin it might be converging to the zero function. So here I have zoomed in closer to the origin. And it looks like it's converging to the zero function, perhaps. You know, we get these funny things near the corners. Those funny things, sometimes they're, they get high. But if n gets big enough, actually, they sort of settle down. We actually do get uniform convergence to the zero function for the real part of z to the n for a smaller window unit origin. 
a smaller neighborhood of York. And it is, it is actually going to be your own neighborhoods, even though it doesn't quite look like it necessarily is near the corners. Okay, so that's how you can try to visualize it with complex functions. Why is this important? Well, it allows us to prove various things. Okay, and then the, the proofs of those various facts that I'm going to talk about now help us do things. They help us calculate Taylor series, which are useful things. They will also help us think about Laurent series on Friday. Okay, so I've got a bunch of stuff I want to go through now um, that I've written out ahead of time. I will post this on Google. After class, if somebody can send me a note to remind me, post it on the middle. So you may want to just focus and listen. I will, from time to time, you know, illustrate these things with examples. Uh, either writing things out by hand or on Mathematica. You can see the first bullet point there is something we've already said. What is the Taylor series for a function that's analytic at Z0? It's that infinite series. A real important theorem that's sort of foundational for the rest of section 5.2 is this one here. You can describe it as Taylor series for analytic functions converge to those functions on appropriate disks. Okay, let's look at the statement of it. So suppose f is analytic. You could phrase it as at z0. That means it's going to be analytic on a neighborhood z0. So you will be able to find a disk of some radius, call it R, an open disk on which the function is analytic. And that's the hypothesis of the theorem. The conclusion is, then the Taylor series for F centered at Z0 converges, at least point-wise, to F on this disk. In other words, for any fixed Z in this disk, the sequence of complex numbers, what are these things called? Do you remember? That's the sequence of partial sums. We're talking about series here. When you're talking about <laughs> series, infinite sums, you have to talk about convergence in terms of the sequence of partial sums. It's really important. Now, we can't literally add up infinitely many things. But we can rigorously define what we are what we mean when we, we, we pretend to add up infinitely. This is rigorous. Okay, we can say this sequence of complex numbers converges to f of z for any fixed z in the disk. Furthermore, you can say a little bit more with regard to uniform convergence. For any r prime, that's that's not a derivative there; it's just another number bigger than zero but less than the given capital R. The convergence is actually uniform on the closed subdisk. Putting an r prime there because this has a radius r prime. I'm putting a bar over it because it's closed. Remember, we talked about the closure of a set briefly when we were talking about topology. And I used a bar notation. <clears throat> so my bar notation there is emphasizing that that inequality is less than or equal to. So there's some, for, for any closed subdisk, R prime has to be less than R, but it could be really close to R. That's R prime. The convergence is going to be uniform, and that's really good. That's a good thing that that happens, because that's what allows the rest of the theory to work, is the fact that the convergence is uniform and closed subdisk. So this is true for analytic functions, which again are differentiable in the neighborhood of the point. Let me, before I go on, just contrast this with the real case. In real analysis, when you talk about even infinitely, dif infinitely differentiable functions, this is not necessarily true. Here's an example. You might want to write down this, this example. Example of what? Of a, or an infinitely differentiable, infinitely, got derivatives of all orders real function whose Taylor series 
centered on zero does not converge to it anywhere except at zero. Use Taylor series at zero. I'll call it x zero equals zero. Does not converge to the function. except at zero. What is this example? Well, you have to define it piecewise. It's f of x equals e to the negative 1 over x squared if x is non-zero, and 0 if x does equal 0. Is the graph of that function look like? Let's try to get mathematical to make it here. <clears throat> you can do piecewise functions in Mathematica. If it's just got two pieces, you can use if, if command. If it's got more than two pieces, you can use something called the which command. You also, in the palette, can find button that does piecewise formulas is this one right there. Let's kind of see the curvy race filter here. <coughs> That's the easiest thing to do. Uh, by the way, if you want to add rows to this, just like you can add rows to matrices from the palette, I believe it's control R. Let me try that. Control R. Oops, no, no, not control R. I think on my, my computer it was called control R. Oh, no, I think it's control return. Let me try that. There we go. That worked. Control return added another row to it. But I don't need another row. I just wanted to show you that you can do it. So this is e to the negative 1 over x squared if x is not 0. You can make a not equal to by doing an escape exclamation point equals escape. Makes it not equal. I'll do that again. Escape, exclamation point equals escape. Makes it not equal to. And zero of x is zero. What does the graph of this look like? Before we have Mathematica make it for us. Um, let's try to guess what it looks like. Talking about a real function here. Certainly, if x is non-zero, the output is positive. E to this power is going to be a positive number. As x gets further away from zero, gets really big, like 10, 100, 1,000, the power here becomes really close to zero function must approach e to the 0, which is 1. What happens if x is close to 0 and gets closer and closer to 0 without equaling it? This quantity, this negative 1 over x squared, is going to become a really big negative number, right? Like negative a million, negative a billion, whatever. e to such a number is really close to 0. So I'm guessing this function looks something like this. That's why I'm guessing. Let's see if I'm right. I think I'm pretty sure I'm right. And there's a but there's a subtlety that I haven't mentioned yet about it. Yep, there we go. Certainly it's differentiable when x is non zero. Is it differentiable when x is 0? And if it is, what is its derivative? What's f prime of 0? Can Mathematica calculate it? Uh, well, it seems to give us an error, though it still spits back an answer. How about f double prime of 0? Hmm. Can we trust this? Is, is it, are these all really 0? I'm not sure why it's saying the tag is protected. 
I did this okay? Oh, I wonder if it's because I, it wants to set x equal to 0 there. I think I need a delta equal sign. Does x have a value? Okay, that is getting, getting rid of the error. Are these right? Are all the derivatives zero? Mathematica seems, seems to think so. Actually, this is a case where Mathematica is correct. The derivatives of this function at zero are all zero. The function is really, 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 really flat near zero. There's what it looks like from negative 1 to 1. How about negative 0.01 to positive 0.01? The graph is really, 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 really flat. In fact, it's so flat, it's very, very well approximated by the zero function. It's so flat that all its derivatives at zero are zero. What would that mean about its Taylor series? That would mean its Taylor series is 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. Forever. But this function is not zero when x is non-zero. It's just really, really close to zero if x is close to zero. It's not equal to zero. Looks like it equals zero, but that's deceiving. Did I change the plot range to see it's non-zero here? Probably. Oh, I don't know. How about something like this? Well, that didn't quite work. Add a few more zeros. Still not doing it. Add a few more zeros. Maybe I should test the value here. What's f of 0 0.005? Oh boy. I would have been going a long time. <laughs> Whoa. Can you imagine? Times of positive 17,372. You know a Google, not the search engine, but the number Google, which is spelled differently than the search engine. It's 10 to the 100. You know that's bigger than the number of atoms in the observable universe? That's how big Google is. 10 to the positive 17,372. Mathematic and handle something like this. Oh. oh. Whoa. <laughs> it's really, 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 really close to zero, but not equal to zero. It's, in, it's infinitely differentiable, including that zero, but it's Taylor series, which is the zero function only converges to it at zero. This kind of thing can't happen with analytic functions in the complex plane. The Cauchy integral formula, along with some fancy manipulation of geometric series and an inequality for integrals can be used to prove this. Um, <coughs> I was thinking maybe I'd try outlining the proof, but I think that would take too much time. It's an application of the Cauchy integral formula. Pretty significant application. The Taylor series not only converges on the disk, but it converges to the function. For extra emphasis, to the function, it equals the function on that disk. Not just converges, but equals the function. Let me jump down to a corollary of this, which is <clears throat> related to your quiz. Uh, this one here. <clears throat> I did that on purpose. Related to your quiz. If you haven't taken it yet. If F is analytic at a point, meaning it's analytic on the neighborhood of the point, don't ever forget that. Differentiable on the neighborhood. Then the Taylor series for f centered at z0 will not just converge to the function in some neighborhood, 
of the, of Z0, but it converges to the function in the largest open disk centered at Z0 uh, over which F is analytic. That means, for example, that, well, the book calculates the, the Taylor series for the tangent function centered at 0 by doing some tricks with multiplication and solving for coefficients. I'm going to show you, you can find the Taylor series for the tangent function, or at least the first few non-zero terms, by long division, too. Long division of two Taylor series. What's the Taylor series for sine centered at zero? It's this. What's the Taylor series? Oops, Z's, sorry. What's the Taylor series for cosine of z centered at zero? How do you find the series for tangent of z uh, at centered at zero? Well, again, the book essentially multiplies both sides of this equation by the tangent, by, by this thing, by the cosine, and solves for the coefficients of the Taylor series for the tangent by doing some multiplications. But you can actually do this with long division. Do you really want to do it with long division? Sure, you should do it once in your life. Or at least you should watch me do it once in your life. It's not as bad as it sounds. And remember, those of you who are in algebraic structures, long division and synthetic division are useful when you're doing field theory, which you guys have just started now. Let's see. <coughs> Seven factorial, what's that? 5040, I think. What do I have to multiply 1 by to get z? I have to multiply it by z. Hey, there's the first term of the Taylor series for tangent of z centered at 0. Centered at 0 is also called the Maclaurin series. Taylor gets credit for all the series, and Maclaurin gets credit only for the series centered at 0. And then, like most mathematicians, including me, I never even typically bother saying Maclaurin, I just say Taylor. Lord. Now take this and multiply it by this whole thing and put the answer down here and then subtract. Z times 1 is Z. Z times negative Z squared over 2 is negative Z cubed over 2. Z times Z to the 4th over 24 is Z to the 5th over 24. Z times Z to, uh, negative Z to the 6th over 720 is negative Z to the 7th over 720. Is that enough? Now subtract. The z's go away as they should. Uh, negative one sixth plus one half it would be negative one sixth plus three sixth is two sixth or one third. One third z cubed. We are subtracting there, so it's negative one sixth plus one half. Take positive one third. Subtract. Uh, 1 over 120 minus 1 24th, that'll be 1 minus what, 5 over 120, negative 4 over 120, which would be negative 1 30th, minus 1 30th, z to the fifth. I think I won't bother you doing the other one. What do you have to multiply 1 by to get 1 third z cubed? Multiply it by 1 third z cubed. There's the next term of the Taylor series. Now multiply 1 third z cubed by everything. You get 1 third z cubed. 1 third z cubed times this will be negative 1 sixth z to the fifth. Etc. Let's do one more subtraction with one more term. Negative one thirtieth minus negative one sixth 
plus, so we get a negative 1 plus 5 over 30, we get 4 over 30, or 2 fifteenths as the next coefficient. And the next term of the Taylor series will be plus 2 fifteenths. Z to the fifth. Is there a pattern here? I don't know. I've never, never bothered to find out. There's the first three non-zero terms. I'm going to relate it to this thing, by the way. It's not clear how I'm going to relate it to this. I'll be getting to that in a minute here. Let's check it. Series. Oops, that's not even There it is. Series. Why does it change from the one to something else? It says it's in the mode. That's better. Okay. Series tangent z, z comma, where's the center? Zero, what's the first three non-zero terms? Or at least up to the third power. Actually, I'm not sure if the syntax produces the first three or four non-zero terms or just up to the third power. Just up to the third power. There we go. The coefficients are 1, 1 third, and 2 thirteenths, just like I found. We can see more, of course. What's the point? The point, besides showing you that you can do long division with these series, is to come back to this fact here. Tangent of z is analytic at 0. It's Taylor series, the one we found the first three non-zero terms for by hand, and the first 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 non-zero terms of with Mathematica here. Did that count wrong? Nine. Oh, no. That is ten. Sorry. Um, it's going to converge on the largest disk centered at zero on which tangent is analytic. What do you think that disk is? What's the radius? It's going to have poles where? Cosine of z is 0. Pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, what else? 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2, negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2. And those are going to be the only poles because the only roots of cosine are those numbers on the real line. All the roots of cosine of z are real. That has to be verified. That is true. Those are going to be the only poles. So the closest pole to zero is at pi over two and negative pi over two, pi over two units away. This series is going to converge on the disk of radius pi over two. Can you prove that with the ratio test? Um, you'd have to have a, a formula for the coefficients if you're going to try to use the ratio test to prove it. It's easier using this factor. Okay. And this does come up. Because the thing that I said is in the reading in section 5.2. I, I did allude to that once, but you can also do it based on the reading. For any power series, a Taylor series or not, there is a radius of convergence. There is an R, a real number, real number in quotes because <clears throat> we're including infinity. Between 0 and infinity, inclusive, r could be 0, r could be infinity, such that 1, this power series converges on the disk of the open disk of radius equal to capital R, and if r is infinity, this is the entire plane. Actually, this is not the best way to say this. Just, I copied that out of the book, but I mean, some, it is true that some power series converge just at z0, though. They don't seem to be including that in this situation. Let me modify this. If R is greater than zero. 
It's going to converge uniformly on any closed subdisk where r prime is a radius between 0 and r. And it diverges, for sure, this is a theorem, outside the closed disk of radius r. r is the radius of convergence. If it's r is finite, this is going to be non empty. You're going to have divergence outside the disk. The number r is called the radius of if R is infinity, then this empty set converges everywhere, so it doesn't diverge anymore. Okay? Talking about power series here, Taylor series are special kinds of power series. Though as long we're going to see, as long as the radius of convergence is positive, power series always define analytic functions. Power series with positive radius of convergence are basically equivalent to what analytic functions are on those disks of convergence. Using um, some theoretical tools and the assumption of uniform convergence, you can prove theorems like this one. You have a sequence of functions that are all continuous on a set and converging uniformly to some function. The limit function will be continuous. We saw in the real case an example where it was discontinuous. That was the animation. Uh, when you have uniform convergence of the sequence, you also can essentially take the limit of the integrals to find the value of the integrals. We got the assumption of uniform con convergence on a set T to a function F, and we got a contour that's a subset of T the integrals, this sequence of numbers here, converges to this one. Uniform convergence is necessary to prove that. And in the context of analytic functions, if you have uniform convergence on some domain, and by domain here I am, meaning open connected set that is also simply connected, no holes in it, all loops can be shrunk to zero without leaving the set shrunk to a point. Then the limit function is also analytic. Okay, so these are all good things. What I'm trying to get across here are technical details of how you can say something that you can say in one sentence imprecisely. Everything that you would hope is true is true. You can integrate term by term. You can differentiate term by term. You can, you can translate these to statements about series too, by the way infinite sums because convergence of series is equivalent to convergence of the sequence of partial sums. Everything you'd hope you could do, integrate term by term, differentiate term by term, multiply series, divide series, all this is true as long as you're within the disk of convergence. And that's essentially things I've said down here. Go with this one, for example. F is analytic at z0. Then the Taylor series for its derivative center at z0 can be obtained by term-wide differentiation of the Taylor series of f. You can you know, differentiate each term in the Taylor series for f. And what do you get? You get the Taylor series for f prime. That's the Taylor series for f prime. And it does converge that. You can integrate term by term, though integrating is a bit trickier. I am assuming that I've got an antiderivative that's all that's also single value here. You know, logs and arc tangents are multi-valued, so you say stick with the assumption that you consider some single valued antiderivative of an analytic function near a point z0. Then you can find a formula for the antiderivative um, by integrating term by term and essentially adding appropriate constants of integration. Um, to get the Taylor series for that to capitalize.
And this statement here is what you need ultimately to say that Taylor series and analytic functions are essentially equivalent. We had the theorem, theorem at the beginning of class that said what? It said if f is analytic at a point, then its Taylor series converges to it on some neighborhood of the point. This sort of says the opposite thing. Given any power series of this form, with a positive radius of convergence, converging to f on some disk, where you're not saying what f is ahead of time, you're saying essentially f of z is, by definition, this series, then those coefficients, these aj's, are going to be the, the Taylor expansion coefficients for f of z centered at z0. In other words, aj is the j derivative of f evaluated at z0 divided by j plus 4. So this completes the circle. This again says that analytic functions and Taylor series, at least when you've got positive radius of convergence, are equivalent to each other. All analytic functions can be represented by Taylor series, and all Taylor series with positive radius of convergence can represent analytic functions. And in fact, all power series with positive radius of convergence can represent analytic functions. And once again, the cauchy angle formula is used. You want to study that in the book. That's a shorter proof. The other proof was that the cauchy angle formula was harder and trickier. Um, I was hoping to do one more example. We're really long time ago. I think I can do an example too. I want to do an example showing you another example where we use a trick to find the Taylor series using tricky algebra and the formula for the sum of the geometric series to find the Taylor series centered at, let's say, i instead of, you know, the example we did a few class periods ago was 8. We centered our Taylor series at 8. Let's pick i this time. Let's say f of z is 5 over 7 plus 11z. And let's find the Taylor series for the centered at i without the Taylor series formula, without taking the derivatives of this thing. Instead, thinking of this as a sum of the geometric series, Well, the first trick is to replace the z by z minus i. But of course, you can't just do that without compensating. By putting a minus i there, I really subtracted 11i, so I need to add it back in. Let's write that like this now. Group together the constants. Now let me write the plus 11 times z minus i as minus negative 11 times z minus i. I'd like this to be a 1 right there, so factor out 2 plus 11 i out of the bottom. Seven. Where? 7, thank you. Factor out of 7 plus 11 i out of the bottom. That can go up top in the denominator of this thing. What happens on the bottom? You can do this. Of course, you probably want to simplify this thing, put it in standard form. Negative 11 over 7 plus 11i. Multiply it by the co complex conjugate of the bottom, on the top and the bottom. So we give you negative 77. Well, let's put the minus sign up top here. Minus 77, then plus 121i, divide by 7 squared plus 11 squared, 49 plus 121. I have not made a mistake. Looks like we have negative 77 over. Uh, 170 plus 121 over 170i. That could go in here, right there. Let's just give this a name and call it done. Uh, let's call it uh, B. B. 
your, series, your uh, function then is in the form 5 over 7 plus 11i over 1 minus b times 7 minus i. You can now write this as a, as a geometric series, which is going to be the Taylor series centered at i. I won't finish it because we're out of time, but this would be the a, the first term, and this thing would be the common ratio r, where b is this thing. Okay, you can expand it as a plus ar plus ar squared plus ar cubed, etc. Right, I'm done. We'll see you on Friday. Don't forget about the quiz tonight.